we always like to recognize specific moms here on Mother's Day. And, um, and so what we're going to do, we have flowers up here, and we're going to pass out flowers to the oldest mom in the room. Help me out. To the newest, newest. the newest mom in the room. Uh, that means the one who had the baby most recently, yes. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to have the baby and a receipt with you if you're the newest mom. <laughs> and, and then what we call the mom with the most, the mom with the most kids. Yes. All right. So uh, uh, it, it, I, I guess we'll probably start out with the oldest mom in the room. But before we do that, let's just uh, let's recognize all the moms in here. You go ahead and stand up. All the moms stand up. OK. And just uh, give them a big round of applause. OK. Good deal. And um, OK. OK. Now go ahead and sit down and uh, and we are going to do the oldest mom first here. And I, I say we start. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Seventy. Maybe maybe seventy. So let's do sixty. So sixty. Now it's seventy. Seventy. That's not old. That's not. It's very not old. old. It's not old anymore. It's, the older know, we get, yeah, yeah. I don't know. But I, the, in the last service, the oldest mom was eighty-four. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can beat that. Yeah. Let's beat it. I think we can. All right. So we'll start seventy. So seventy. All seventy. Right. All moms seventy years old and older, please stand. All right, all right, yeah. Good, 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 good. Okay. Now, um, here's what we're going to do. Don't sit down. Keep, keep standing, keep standing. Um, 70 and older, still stay, stand up. Stay. Okay, she's going to sit anyway. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to count up. I'm going to count up, and when I get to your age, um, and, uh, or past your age, then you go ahead and sit down, okay? Is that clear? I okay. like that. I like yeah. it. Okay, uh, 71, 72, 73, you're not budging, <laughs> 74, 75, uh, we lost one there, okay, ooh, they're dropping fast now. 76. Gotta yeah, beat yeah. the last service. 77. All right, all right, all right. Um, do, we, do we have any? We got just, two. Do we have two? Oh, right there. Plus the lady who. What was I on? To was, stand. She's allergic to flowers. Se, okay, where are we at? Uh, 78? 70, we're on 78. Uh, 79. 79. 80. Oh, okay, 80. Is, is no one standing? Oh, we have her. Right here, right here. All right, I, I, think, I think you are it, ma'am. Uh, Pastor Glenn is going to come to you and find out, say, say, find out your age. Is that right? Happy Mother's Day. Hey. Oh, she's 84 too. Oh, wow. So 84 years number. old. Okay. Very, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, now let's move on. Um, the, the newest mom, the newest mom in the room. And, and the way we're going to do this is if you've had a baby within the last year, you go ahead and stand up, okay? A baby within the last year. Right there. Oh, wow. wow. This is, is that this could be. done? Yeah. <laughs> What do you mean by that? I don't, well, know. I, I don't know. I don't know how many kids she has, but so really, that's that's awesome. Okay, yeah, hurry, come oh, on. Hurry. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. What's, what's your baby's name? Matthew. When when was she's not Matthew? Matthew and Abby. Oh, and Maddie. Yeah. When were they born? When was? That's awesome. Wait, Maddie's fifteen, and the baby oh. is nine months. Wow. I thought she was going with Maddie, you know, and yeah. Well, that's neat. All right, now the mom with the most. Oh, this is this is a good one. This is always fun. Yeah. Uh, last service. Eight. We eight. had a tie. A tie for eight. Yeah. For eight. Yeah. And then okay. there was one lady that only had one, but he was a very difficult child, so <laughs> she felt she deserved it. But. <laughs> 
I, th I think uh, it's always good on this one to start at two because moms, if you had one and just said, I'm going to have another, you're, you, good job, you know. Uh, so two or more kids, go ahead and stand up, okay? Two or more kids. Two or more kids, okay. All right, we'll, we'll count up. Three or more kids. Yeah. All After that things. second, man. Four or more kids. Mm. Okay, okay. Five or more kids. Wow. Wow. Do you have those kids with you? <laughs> Six or more kids. It's a standoff. We've got seven or more. Seven or more. Eight or more. Look, she just got that look like. She just like. <laughs> keep how, going. How many, how many? I think you're it. I think you are it, man. Eight kids. Yeah, eight wow. kids. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Give Pastor Glenn, my lovely assistant, a round of applause. Thank you very much, sir. And go ahead and grab your Bibles, your pens, your notes. Plan to get you out of here really fast today, all right? How many of you got reservations? Huh, huh, huh? No? You're not taking your mom out? Come on, at least take her to Arby's or something, okay? <laughs> Do something nice. All right. All right, so here we are in a series that we call Weirdos. And if you've been coming for the last several weeks... You know that this series is all about how we are often looked at as weird in the culture in which we live because we don't do the same things that the rest of the culture does. Do we stand apart? Are we set apart? Are we set apart living on purpose rather than people who simply live under peer pressure? That's why we call ourselves weirdos. But today, I want to talk to you about my weird mom. Yeah, I always thought my mom was weird. How many of you thought your mom was weird? Yeah, some of you still do, I know. But I always look around and all the other kids' moms and thought, I wish my mom was cool like that. I wish my mom let me do this, but I was to realize that my mom was weird as I was growing up. But you see, as I grew a little bit older, I began to realize that the weirdness of my mom was actually what helped shape me to be the person that God wants me to be. So we're talking about the weird moms today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much as we come and we worship you and we celebrate you and we thank you for what you have done in our lives and Father, especially for the, the moms that you put into our lives, the moms who would invest in us, calling out the best in us. Father, in the same way, may we listen to your spirit so you'll lead us and you'll guide us, that we will become those people who honor you and serve you in everything that we do. Help us, Father, to find that wisdom, that wisdom that comes from you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A year ago on Mother's Day, I uh, decided I was going to send my mom a little gift through a package in the mail. She lives in Florida. And uh, so I decided I was going to send her that um, package down there. And, and uh, you know what you do? You get online and you, you type it all out and where it's going and all that stuff. But it, all, it, it saved this little spot on there. It was, a, it was the, the, the tag, in essence. And it said uh, you can fill in whatever you want. And so, so I began to type out, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. And then I signed it, Your Favorite Child. <laughs> and I sent it off. And I just waited. I waited. You know what I was waiting for? I was waiting to see if it was really true what I thought about myself, that I indeed was the favorite child. You see, I have two sisters, and I can never imagine how my mom survived raising my two sisters, you know. But uh, I was obviously that gift from God to her. Um, <laughs> but uh, there I wait, and, and finally, uh, uh, a day later, my phone buzzes, and it's a text from my mom, and, and it said... Dear favorite child, <laughs> I love you. Thanks for the gift. Signed, Mom. So I, I took a screenshot of it. <laughs> Didn't want to lose that and, and showed my sisters. And there's proof right there. There's proof. And yes, yes, 
favorite child. Uh, real quick, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a middle child, and uh, I have an older sister and younger sister. And I've always, how many middle children we have in here? Got any middle children in here? I just want you to know, you are the favorite, okay? Um, and the way I see it, here's, here's kind of how it all goes down. You really are the favorite. And the reason is, first of all, um, where are the firstborners, the, the firstborn? Yeah, you're, you're all like, I'm perfect. I'm so perfect. I know. Um, but you firstborn, what happened was uh, you're, you, you were born and your parents, they, they had all these ideals and all these things that they needed to do to make a good child. And, and after a while, they're like, uh, can we get a do-over? <laughs> and so they have another kid, and that then becomes the middle child, obviously, if you have another child. And so they get it right on the middle child. They get it right. And so you really are the favorite. Uh, but then they think, we did good on the second child, so, so maybe we can make a third one, and that's where it goes wrong, right there. <laughs> um, how many of you are, are, are last born? Last born. Yeah, you're like, look at me, look at me. I know. Uh, trying to get some attention. That's, I know, I know. And, 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 and that's when they finally say, last born, we quit, we give up, and it's all over. So, I, indeed, um, you middle children are the favorite, and I am the favorite. I, I am obviously the favorite of my mom. But uh, the truth is, that's kind of the weird things about mom. Um, one of the weird things so about mom is, is that, that she can really kind of have each child as a favorite and love each child in that same way. And, and I want to talk to you about that weirdness here today. That, that thing that mom would do, that thing, the way she would invest in you and the way she would teach you and the way she would train you. Yeah, mom was very, very weird. She did not let me do what so many other kids, all the other kids that got to go see uh, this movie and I want to go see this movie and said, you are not, not going to go see that movie. And mom would, mom, instead of giving me all the junk food I wanted, would feed me vegetables, you know, and, and why can't I have a mom like that? And mom did all these weird things, but mom had some weird things that she would say to me, weird statements. And you know what I'm betting that many of your moms said this very th same things that I'm about to read to you here this morning. It says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, don't neglect your mother's instruction. And it's interesting, as we look here in God's Word, we see several of these phrases that come out, this wisdom that mom gives us. And so I'm going to give you several lessons I learned from my weird mom, and, uh, and you can write them down, see if your mom said the same thing, and then we'll get out of here this morning. The first one is simply this, number one. I don't care what everybody else is doing. How many of you had a mom who's ever said that? And it always came after the phrase. It always came after the phrase. It was our argument. We're making our case. But mom, everybody's doing it. And she goes, I don't care what everybody else is doing. And then often she would follow it with the phrase. Yeah, there it was. I heard it. I heard it. If everybody jumped off a cliff, would you too? And I always thought, why, are, why is everybody always jumping off cliffs, you know? Um, <laughs> what's wrong with that? But, but that's where she, everybody, then, and, and, but, you know, when she would ask the question, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you too? And if I was going to be honest, I'd have to be like, I might, Mom. I really, <laughs> maybe. But why? Why would you do that? Well, I think we find the secret here in Scripture. It's found in Proverbs. We just read Proverbs 1.8, don't neglect your mother's instruction. But Proverbs 1.10, it kind of carries on. And, and if you ever read this and study this passage, you find it very, very interesting. Proverbs 1.10 says, my child, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. And then it goes on to say, and I'll just kind of paraphrase, says if, if some guys come around and they say, hey, come on, why don't you go with us? Hey, let's, let's go find somebody that we can rob. Hey, let's go kill somebody and take all their stuff. And he says, don't go with them. And now it's so weird because you're reading through that and you're going, well, that's kind of obvious, right? I mean, I don't think I'm tempted like that very often. If somebody, if somebody came up to me today and said, hey, man, you want to go, uh, let's go kill somebody. I'd be like, no. 
That's, that's easy. That's an easy answer. No. What, are you crazy? I wouldn't do that. And so you're, you're kind of reading this. You're going, why, is, why are they saying this? But I think the secret is in a little word that you see repeated time and time again. It's the word let's. 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 Why? Because there's the hook. There's the hook that is a hook for so many of us. Something we find ourselves doing that we thought we would never, ever do. And the reason is because of the let's. I want to be included. I want to be accepted. I want to be a part. I don't want to be the, the one on the out. I want to be the one on the in with the others. I want finally to have some value and some worth in, in people accepting me and including me. It's the let's. And he's saying, there's the hook. There's the hook. If somebody says let's, then, well, everybody's doing it. If everybody's doing it, then I want to be doing it with everybody because that's what everybody's doing. I don't want to be left out. I find my value and I find my worth in what other people say I am. I thought it was very interesting doing some studies on gangs here in the United States. And there's been a lot of research done in recent years on all these gangs and why, why so many would, would go and join a gang. And, and, and it was, the most interesting thing about it is they say it, it's, it's, it all comes down to that acceptance, that feeling or being a part of a family even, they call it a family, people who would accept me, people who would include me, people who would allow me in. And it's that same thing that drives so many of us. And our moms are trying to point out to us, if everybody jumped off a cliff, are you crazy? What would you do? No, I don't care what everybody else is doing. You're never going to find your value. You're never going to find your worth by being included over here, included over here. You're not going to find your value and your worth in the external things. The external things, that's where we look so very often. What are those external things that we look to find our value in? Well, it might be in a relationship. And if I date this particular person, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to feel valuable to somebody. Or if I marry this person, if, I, if I'm in a relationship with this person, then I get a little bit of value and worth that I've been looking for. Or maybe other external things will be the things that I wear. For me, man, I had that battle my whole life. It, it was, I, I was going from, from, from uh, a parachute pants to Lacoste shirts, and a big one for me, man, it was always, I just remember, I, I came home and I said, Mom, please, you got to go, take me to Belk, take me to Belk, you got to get me this jacket that everybody was wearing, had a little tag, it said members only, <laughs> I begged Mom for a members only, Mom, I want to be a member. And finally, mom took me and bought me my baby blue members only jacket. I sported that thing around. Oh my goodness, I had the snaps right there and everything. Nothing cooler than that. But it was something external where I could say, now I'm of value and now I'm of worth. It was in how I dressed, or maybe it was in performance. And maybe some of us are still at that same place today, and maybe mom's words are ringing true. You know, if I do really good at this, then people will appreciate me. If I do good at this, then people will notice me. Or maybe if I finally get this, this uh, rolled up piece of paper that I can hang on my wall that says, you did something, you accomplished something, there's my value, and there's my worth. But as long as I go through life looking for my value and worth out here, I'm always going to find myself empty in here and hungry, hungry and starving for more, which is the very thing that drives me. If everybody else is doing it, why shouldn't I? But maybe, just maybe, when mom would say, I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't see your value in how you dress. That's not where it's at. I don't see your value in who you hang out with or the people that you're with. That's not where your value is at. I don't see your value in, in how you appear or how you look. I don't see your value in all these things. There's a greater value and a greater worth, and it's, it's inside. It's found inside of you. Have you discovered that yet? Even though your mom said that all those years ago, have you discovered where that real value and that real worth is? I'm going to share with you in just a moment of how you find that. Just a moment of how you find that real value and that real worth. But that was the first thing mom would say. I don't care what everybody else is doing. That's number one. What else did she used to say? Number two, write it down. You worry about you. Anybody? Huh? 
You ever hear that? And why would she say that? She would say that to me because, well, you have to understand, me being the, uh, the perfect child, it was my job to point out all the faults in my sisters, right? Um, anytime they would be doing something, um, well, it would only be wrong. It would only be wrong. It wouldn't be right uh, if they didn't get in trouble for it. And so, so oftentimes I would go and, and tell on them, hey, do you, do you know what Sandy did? Do you know what Holly did? Mom, mom, check this out. And you, it was a cry for justice. That's what it was, you see. But mom would always respond with, you worry about you, I will take care of them. And, and I always enjoyed when she took care of them, you know what I mean? <laughs> that was, uh, oftentimes they would, she'd send me to my room, uh, you go to your room, and, because I don't want you to have to hear uh, what's, what I'm about to do to this. Uh, and, and I'd be at the door listening, you know. Because it was, it was, it was always, if, if I could focus on them, and what they did wrong. And it's so interesting because this is a lesson I'm still trying to learn today. How often is it that we find ourselves focusing on what everybody else does and where they fall short and not at all looking at ourselves? It's what I call the uh, accuse and excuse syndrome. I'm so good at accusing everybody else and excusing myself. Accuse and excuse. Point out the faults in other people. And one of the reasons why we go through life pointing out the faults in all the other people is simply because if I can point out your faults, then for that moment I can feel a little bit better about myself. And so we accuse and we point and we say, you're messing up here and you do this wrong and you do this wrong. Never taking for a minute looking at ourselves and where we need that healing where we need that help. And David put it best. He goes, search me, O oh God, and know my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. I love the way Jesus puts it here in Matthew chapter 7, this you worry about you. He says, don't judge others and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, he says. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And you can kind of picture Jesus as he's saying this to the crowds around him. And, and there are those in the crowd who are called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees have always been really good about pointing out the faults and where everybody else is going wrong and not obeying the law. And Jesus gives this illustration, which in the day and the time would have been hilarious, called he Hebrew humor. And uh, it, was, it was always comparison humor. And so here, here's Jesus up there and he's saying, hey, 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 hey. Um, how can you worry about the speck in your, in, in, in your neighbor's eye when you got this big log in your own? Everybody been laughing, ah! All the while realizing that's, that's what the Pharisees are doing. They're so good at pointing the faults of everybody else that they never take a minute to evaluate their own heart and see where they're in need. And so it just reminded me as I'm reading through this, that's what mom used to say. That's what mom used to say. You worry about you. Number three, lessons learned from a weird mom. You had better watch your mouth. Anybody ever get that one? Yeah, you had better watch your mouth. Let me ask a little survey real quick. How many of you um, were uh, 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 bar of soap kids um, with a, yeah. Really, raise your hands up. You got, you got the soap in the mouth, right? Okay. Uh, how about this one? How many of you were hot sauce kids? Yeah. The hot sauce. Yeah, the hot sauce. Um, uh, was there anything else? Any ingenious moms? Huh? I can't, I can't hear the very well. They would have to hold books. Ooh. That's a scary mom right there, guys. Um, yeah. All right, all right. I'll tell you my, I'm having a hard time hearing you guys, but um, my mom, uh, she would always had this way where she would quote verses, 
as she's uh, giving out punishment. And there was this one verse in Proverbs chapter 10 that says, as vinegar is to the teeth, and there's her idea. <laughs> and so part of watching your mouth, if I would ever say something that I shouldn't say, I would have to take a teaspoonful of vinegar as she quoted verses to me. So mine was, mine was vinegar. Uh, but it was all about watching your mouth. Why? Why? Well, here's why. James 3, 6. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. <whistles> Strong words, right? Well, we do know, but we do see what the tongue can do. We do see the damage. How many of you have ever been where there was a forest fire? Anybody? There's a place up in the mountains where I go fishing, and, and, and one year I'm going, it's beautiful, the mountainside, and it's just uh, green and huge trees, and I go back up there, and it's just completely wiped out. Just by one small campfire, one small campfire that just got out of control. And that's what he's saying right here. The tongue is the same thing. On one hand, the tongue can, can be something that warms you up, that makes you feel good in its right place, there in the fireplace. But if it escapes, it can get out of control, can it not? And it just goes and goes and goes. It, it, you can't contain it. You can't. Maybe some of you remember the devastation by these forest fires this last year out on the West Coast. The damage that it's able to do. And he's saying the tongue is the same thing. The tongue is the same thing. On one hand, it can build people up. On one hand, it can encourage people. On one hand, it can be words that are spoken by a mom that changes the direction of their child's life. And on the other hand, that same tongue can do terrible, terrible damage. It can destroy life. It can cut. I had a man in my office the other day, and I thought it was, it was so sad. I was talking to him a little bit about church, and, and, uh, and he was talking about uh, going to church. But uh, I said, and your wife. I asked him about his wife, and he kind of dropped his head a little bit, and he goes, oh, yeah, my wife, she hadn't been to, been to church in, in a long time. And I said, really, what happened? He goes, well, she went to church, and there were these women that just started gossiping and saying things and, and just kind of spread. And when she heard that they were talking about her like that, she quit church and hadn't been back since. And I thought, oh, man. In church of all places, too. The, the tongue can be the very thing that shares the good news with somebody who doesn't know the good news, and the tongue can be the very thing that, that runs people away from ever hearing the good news. And what devastation just by untamed tongues. Uh, James says, how can it be? How can it be that, that on one hand we can be in church and we're singing and we're praising God with that same tongue, and then the next minute it's cursing. It's cutting people down. It's doing damage. It's hurting other people. How can that even possibly be? Here's my challenge. You know how to tame the tongue? Fill your mouth with praising and prayer. So much so that there's not room for anything else. That's one of the things I love about my mom. When I was a, when I was a kid growing up, um, and we get be getting ready for school every morning. We had this upstairs hallway, and my bedroom was always a place where once I get ready in the morning, I'd have to walk down past my parents' bedroom uh, to go downstairs and, and go off to school. And I'd be every it was like every morning. I promise you, every morning um, I'd walk past my mom and dad's bedroom, and the door was always cracked just a little like that. And I'd glance in, and every morning without fail, you know what I would see? I'd see I'd see on my mom's bed. Her, her, her Bible spread out, her notebook, and she'd be there praying. And I always knew she was praying for me, praying for her son, praying for her kids. And what's so cool about this, too, is not only did I have a mom like that, but I married somebody just like that, too. And uh, by the way, here's the mother of my kids back there. Kim, go ahead and stand up. And I want you all to appreciate her, okay? But... Uh... <laughs> She loves when I do that, okay? She just loves when I do that, yeah, yeah. Some of you are wondering if I was even going to be here today after what I said last week, but hey, we're, we're good, okay? 
But, you know, that's one of the things I, I know. She's a prayer warrior, and she, her, her kids know she prays for them. I know she prays for me. She fills, fills her mouth with prayer. And, and that's what Jesus said. Hey, hey, if you feel like cursing somebody, if you feel like talking about somebody, you feel like spreading, instead, instead, why don't you pray for them? Start praying for them. He said, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who say bad things about you. Pray for those who hurt you. And so we fill our mouths up with praise and with prayer instead of. And that's what controls. That's what begins to control that tongue. You had better watch your mouth, Mom said. Number four, be careful who your friends are. Be careful who your friends are. My weird mom always wanted to know who I was hanging out with. She was always checking in. Who's this person? Tell me about this person. Who's this person? Tell me about this person. Who are you hanging out with? Why? Well, she knew. She knew. You become just like the people that you hang out with. How many of you remember, and maybe you're in high school now, but back in the day, I don't know if it's any different right now, but back when I was in high school, at Morrow High School, I can still picture the, uh, the lunchroom and at lunchtime. And in our lunchroom, we had uh, groups of people that would all sit together, huh? And uh, I can still name the different groups of people in our lunchroom. And, and there was the, uh, uh, the jocks at one table, right? And they would all sit together. And then at another table, all the cheerleaders would sit together. And then there was the 80s heavy metal rockers. And, uh, you know, they had those uh, heavy metal t-shirts, Def Leppard, and all the, the t-shirts and the, the hair and the mullets and stuff, you know. And, and that was going on. And then there was uh, what we called the nerds, you know, and they're all the smart kids, you know, set together at another table. And we even had a couple's table where you had to be a couple to sit with everybody else at this couple's table. We had to, you know, that was all going on. And so all these different places. But you ever notice that when somebody would find their way into one of those groups, after a little while, they all started looking just like each other. Everybody looks like each other in these different groups. And that same thing happens. The people who we spend time with, the people who we hang out with, that's what we actually become. It says right here, 1 Corinthians 15, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. You know, I know something about you. I know something about you. I bet I do. I bet that if you go to the grocery store and you go to the produce section and you want some apples, You'll go and you'll get your bag and you'll start picking up your apples, but you'll pick up an apple and you'll kind of do this, right? What are you looking for? Bruises. Looking for bruises, looking for those dark spots. And if you find a dark spot or a bruise, well, you put it back, right? Because, you, you know, that, that spot right there is going to make it rot all the quicker, and here's the thing, so many of us are so selective in, in choosing, but the problem is we're more selective in choosing our apples than we are our friends. And as you guys know, a bad apple ruins the whole bunch. But is there somebody, somebody in your life, you're choosing friends, that when, if you were to be honest, you're going to go, wow, wow, they're not building me up. They're, they're leading me down the wrong path wrong direction. I thought it was so wise. A man in Celebrate Recovery, this last week, he was a little nervous going back home. And he told everybody he's nervous going back home. He's got to be on guard. got to be careful. And the reason is because when he goes back home to see his mom, where his mom lives, surrounded by all his old buddies. And he knows when he gets there, those same old buddies who led him down the wrong way in the beginning will be there trying to do the same thing again. And so he's going, i got to be careful, got to be on guard. And that's wise, that's wise to be watching, to be careful. I realize we've got to move on. Number four was be careful who your friends are. Find those who will encourage you, who will sharpen you, who will build you up. Number five, there's nothing to be afraid of. You ever have your mom come in when you're scared and tell you you don't have to be afraid? You don't have to be afraid. You, hey, you know something? All these storms going on. I had, we had a storm come over our house a couple nights ago. Loud clashes of thunder and lightning. I just want you guys to know something. I am not afraid of storms. I'm not. But you know why? Because when I was a little kid, I remember being afraid of a big thunderstorm coming over. And my mom came and said, you don't have to be afraid of storms. 
She, goes, she, she explained it this way, and I don't even know if it's true or not. She goes, that's God's way of cleaning out the skies. <laughs> Sounds good, right? And then, then, you know what we would do? She would take me out to the front porch. The front porch of our house. We're outside. And we'd sit there in the rocking chairs and just watch the storm come. The loud clashes of lightning and thunder. Boom, boom, boom. The winds pick up. And, and it got, we would do this every time a storm would come. It got to be so much that I always, as to this day, I love to go outside and watch the storm come. For me, it's so relaxing. It's enjoyable. You might think that's weird or strange, but I learned not to be afraid. And what I'm trying to tell you is you might be going through a storm in your life right now. It might be threatening you. You might be upset. You might be worried about it, but that you would hear, you don't have to be afraid. There's somebody who's greater. There's somebody who's got this. There's somebody who cares about you. Even this right here. Isaiah 41.10, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Now, who can say that? Can you? I told you earlier, I'm going to tell you where the value comes from, where the worth comes from. And I hope it sinks in. I hope you get it. So many of us have been busy out there looking for worth and value in all these other places, trying so hard. When I was a little kid, I remember going, I was, I was a kid who always liked to get in creeks and play in creeks. Any of you do that? I was outside, man, every creek I could find. I was, and, and the reason is because I would go down and I'd have a jar and I'd flip over the rocks. And in, under the rocks, I knew I'd probably find a crawdad. That's what we called them. Some of you call crawfish. That's wrong, okay? Um, <laughs> but we call it a crawdad and a salamander. And I'd be looking for crawdad, salamander. If I found a snake, that was bonus, you know? But I was catch I, I love playing in creeks. And so I remember, I remember we, we took a little trip up to the North Georgia mountains, and there was this park that had picnic tables sitting alongside the river. And the name of the river, the name of the park was called Shooting Creek. And the reason it was called Shooting Creek is because it was, it was a bunch of water. It's more like a river that just came over this dam. And then when it went over this dam, it created such force that it shot out around the rocks and just with a lot of force. And so I remember seeing this. I was so excited. It's going to be great. We're going to have a picnic and just going to be able to play. But then my mom, she goes, no, 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 come here, come here, look. I want you to see this stuff. And she showed me all these signs that said, don't go near the water, dangerous, stay out, you're going to die, okay? And uh, she said, do you see that? And I said, yeah, I see that. And she goes, that means you can't go in the water, okay? you got to go do something else. And I was just dying as a kid. How, how am I not supposed to get in the creek? Well, they, they went off and they started getting the picnic ready, uh, and mom and dad and their friends and, and my sisters and and, uh, and so I just, I, I, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. And so next thing you know, I'm over there, and I'm just going to flip over a couple rocks to kind of see what I can find. And I stepped on one rock that was slick, and I shot out into Shooting Creek. And in that split second, that moment there, I was in way over my head. My foot actually caught a rock. And the water was pushing me down, and I, I was trying my best to keep my head above water, but, but it was just above my mouth and just below my nose. And I realized I couldn't yell, I couldn't scream, I was just fighting the best that I could. And I thought, okay, this is it, this is it, this is it. It hadn't been a long life, but this is it. <laughs> and, and the best I can, I, I'm looking over to the, to the shoreline, and as I look over to the shoreline, I spot my dad. And my dad spots me, and he's like... I'm thinking, what is he doing? And he's just wandering around looking for a stick or something, you know. My dad always said, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be dumb, you better be tough. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking he believes in natural selection at this moment here, you know. It's like, oh well, oh well. But there I am, and I'm struggling, I'm struggling. He's wandering around over there, but then I saw this, this flash. 
this movement, this, it, was, it was so fast and so quick. It was like a streak of lightning without any hesitation whatsoever. I caught a glimpse of my mom. <laughs> and I'll have you know, my mom dove in head first. In that second, she swam over. She wrapped her arm around me. She swam back with one arm. She gets over to the edge where the rocks are slick, and my dad's over there like, I'm surprised their marriage lasted after that day. <laughs> but my mom pulled me out. She rescued me. And I thought, wow, wow. She saw something worth saving. <laughs> my dad, not so much. <laughs> but my mom saw something worth saving. And there's the point. Somebody loves you enough to dive in head first. He dove in, willing to sacrifice everything because he loves you that much. You can look for worth and value out here all day long and never find it. But when you look in here at what he has done, that's when you find your true value, your true worth. You are worth saving. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Do you know that? Have you received that? Have you realized that he loves you that much? If you have never accepted that, please, here, now, just go ahead and do that. Call out to him and say, Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you died for me. I'm amazed that you love me that much. But I want you to save me. Forgive me of my sin. I want to spend eternity in heaven with you. Friend, when you pray that prayer, you mean with your heart. The Bible says you can know, you can know you're a child of God. You have eternal life. You're one of his best decision you'll ever make. Father, thank you so much for those who just made that decision here today. Father, I pray we would all realize the great worth and value that we have in you. We thank you for the moms who have tried to get that message into us. Father, that we would hear it, that we would know, we would understand. Thank you for the moms in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.